as frequency of the topics. So uh, in this slide, we have the link for global strategy where you can, you can find many information, but also uh, the link for, for the handbook on libraries and all the materials produced like the standard questionnaires, uh, e e uh, electronic learning courses, and many other materials on, on, on libraries. Uh, it's important to highlight that uh, Agris uh, was developed in 2018. Uh, in that time, the, the requirements or the methodology for the 241 indicator was not defined yet. So Agris, the standard model and the handbook do not cover all requirements for 241. That's why uh, we uh, developed additional documents uh, on describing on how to to incorporate in the questionnaire uh, in the process uh, the two for one requirements uh, and sure that uh, our bubble is already talk about these documents that, that was developed by FAO. Um, next, next, please. So uh, on Agris, uh, we developed two options. Uh, two standard options on uh, how to address uh, the 241 indicators. One is um, attached to the core model, a set of questions to complete all data requirements for 241. And it means 32 additional questions because the core is very basic and 241 has uh, 11 sub indicators with a uh, demand of a lot of information. This is one option. Uh, going with that, uh, uh, it could be collecting in a, a single year all the data. Uh, and in the same year, we can attach another, another, another rotating model, but uh, that's uh, one possibility using this methodology to complete the requirements for 241. The second option uh, is to use uh, the rotating models because uh, some requirements for 241 are already uh, present on, on the economy model and the environment model, production methods and environment model. So in this case, uh, the need is to add just 13 additional questions in the economic model and 10 questions in the environment model. Uh, but in, in this, Second options, option, some sub indicators will be produced in a year and other sub indicators in another year. Uh, so the complete um, report of 241, the table with the all information, the 11 indicators uh, in this case, will have two different reference years. One year for some indicators, another year for the some indicators. We have talked about a, a, a survey that uh, is developed mainly in terms of crop session uh, results. This is not a, a big issue, uh, in, considering that also to, uh, sustainability is more, more or less a, a stable, stable uh, uh, it's not change so rapidly one year to one. So that's the two options that were developed for, for using Agris to uh, produce the two form indicators. Okay, now I will talk a bit about the Fit by Threat initiative. It's a large initiative. Oh, oh. There, there are some questions. Bluetooth. Do you prefer to, to no. Okay. Sorry, yeah, but I, I, since I'm sharing the screen, I cannot mute the participant. So please, everybody, please mute yourself because Flavio is still presenting. Okay. If you have any questions, you can raise the hand in the middle of the presentation also. Okay, uh, the FIFA Tech Initiative, uh, similar to the Agri-Survey program, uh, the idea is to improve the capacity of the countries to produce uh, the good statistics in a broader sense. Uh, we have different new emergency uh, uh, 
data, new data required nowadays, and, but have a strong emphasis on the estrogen indicator, mainly for zero hunger, uh, uh, the goal number two, uh, in particular the indicator 221, 222, and 241. So, and also uh, gender uh, perspective, the uh, indicator 581. So, uh, uh, the motivation to implement the CRISPR 13 initiative is really linked to the SDGs. And uh, we have the link to, to for the <coughs> for the website uh, in the bottom. And we can go ahead and next slide. Stephanie, not working. Sorry, no, not working. <laughs> no, I don't know why. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, we, we, as I explained, we are working with some countries in the past already, and this initiative involves three main uh, institutions on implementation that is uh, FAO, World Bank, and IFAT. Uh, in fact, in the initiative, uh, uh, World Bank uh, is managing. Uh, methodological development, IFAD data use, and FAO data production. Also, three components that uh, in the initiative. And uh, some countries uh, are considered pre approved countries, countries that uh, was involved in the past in the RB survey program and, and LSMS RSI program. So as you can see, uh, next year, uh, uh, Uganda, Cambodia, Senegal, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Georgia will be uh, supported by SG430 plus two new countries. In 2022, uh, Burkina Faso, Malawi, Ghana, Tanzania, Armenia, and Nepal, plus five countries. In 2013, Country, um, Mali, Myanmar, Kenya, plus six new countries. That's the, the, the proposal uh, and, and so on uh, in order up to 2026. Uh, 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 the proposal is that we will cover, start working with 50 countries, analyzing. Uh, 2030, uh, at least uh, supporting two or in general three uh, uh, data collection in the cycles. Next. Uh, Flavio, sorry, uh, there are some participants that are asking if you can speak a little bit louder. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, now I need to do the next slide. Okay. Yes. Okay, you can see that the, the system proposed for 3 by 30 is very similar to Argus, it's based on Argus. Uh, again, we have the core model, uh, but in, uh, in the case of 3 by 30, uh, three rotating models are defined. Uh, the name changed a bit. The first, income, labor, and productivity, in fact, that cover economy and labor. Uh, the second, they have the same name that we were talking for Argus, production methods and environment, and then machine equipment and assets. Uh, you can see uh, the, the sequence on Argus is a proposal is a bit different. And, and in the fit by 30, where uh, the standard is a three year sequence cycle. Huh? And uh, fit by 30 has two, uh, two programs. Uh, one in agricultural survey program that's where you are saying that's very similar to to Argus. and the target population are the uh, agricultural households and non-household farms so the non-household sector and household sector in agriculture so uh, uh, the the units of observation are the agricultural holdings 
So we have another program. Next slide, please. Neighbors Integrated Agriculture and Rural Survey Program. Uh, in this case, uh, we have one additional uh, rotating model, neighbor income and livelihood standards. That the focus is live standard uh, as many uh, income of the household. So uh, we have an additional unit observation that the household linked to the to the agricultural holding, and also uh, the target population is is larger, uh, adding non-farm households in the rural areas. In this case. Uh, uh, all the kinds of indicators in terms of rural development will be produced, and uh, it will be possible to do analysis on cross session cross, cross tables uh, relating agricultural activities and uh, social, uh, more deep uh, analysis of social aspects of the household. This, this, this is a, a the configuration of, of, of the fifth by 30. Uh, in this sense, covering uh, more or less what is covered in LSMS as uh, approach, but with a, a annual production of agricultural data and more strong uh, um, tool to capture agricultural activity. Um, well, for or produce two for one. The methodology for feed by 30 was finalized last July. So after uh, definition of two for one. So in this case, all requirements for two for one uh, is already in included in the instrument. Fabio, sorry, I need to stop you because even the translators uh, uh, have difficulties to hear you. I don't know if you have uh, uh, a microphone. <laughs> Um, that you can. Uh, oh, the microphone use, is on. Uh, I don't know how to. No, it is on. We can hear you, but uh, it's very weak. I mean, your voice is not so clear. Okay, I try to talk. Okay, to like, yeah, like so. Be very close to the computer. I, I'm super close. Yeah. <laughs> the, okay. the, like this, it's uh, it's a good. But please also. The translators are asking not to not to move. So if you are ah. close to the computer and you we speak, we have a translator. <laughs> yes, we have a simultaneous translator. Yes. Ah, no, no, I'm not aware. Okay. Okay, Please. speak like this. It's loud now and don't move. <laughs> okay, sorry for okay. interrupting you. More, okay, okay, more clear and yes, okay. yes. So we are almost in the end. <laughs> but boy. Uh, as I'm saying, on the 5 by 30 uh, methodology, uh, the requirements for the indicator 241 uh, is embedded in, in the production method environment uh, questionnaire. Um, the tools developed for 5 by 30 already combine the core and the rotating for different years. And um, the proposal is collect all information for two for one in a single year, the year that uh, covers also other aspects of environment and production methods. Um, next. Stefania. Sometimes it freezes. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I think every time that I open the chat because I see that there are messages, then it's not working anymore. I'm trying, eh? I will manage. Be patient. I don't know why. Oh, okay. Okay. This, this, just to show a bit um, how was developed the tools for Peace by 13. First, uh, we have different tools for the household sector and the non-household sector, uh, where some uh, items are excluded that do not apply for non-household sector. And uh, we have some variation. Eh? Uh, 
the pens going to to the field one time a year, get information about all the year, or going twice a, a year to the field, or twice or, or by season, where we have uh, adapt the questionnaire, divide questionnaire on two options, this post planting and post harvest, more linked to, to, to the season, and have all the complements uh, in fifth by 30. But uh, in any case, the requirements for two for one are included in the ones I highlight with uh, red, uh, the PME uh, egg questionnaire uh, that covers uh, uh, two for one. Well, I think this is the last slide. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity and good, good, good work for all of you. Thank you. Bye bye. Great, bye bye. So we move uh, to the next presentation, which is an introduction to the additional mechanism to measure and monitor sustainable agriculture, which is the PROSA framework. Uh, we have Nathan Warren. Warren. Uh, he's a statistician in uh, our team, so the environmental uh, statistical team, who has worked uh, on PROSA. Uh, he has worked uh, in the areas of food security statistics and food balance sheets uh, within our division. And he has also worked for two years as a statistician uh, at the OECD. OECD. So Nathan, uh, you have the floor. I'm uh, attempting to share my screen, Stefania, if you could um, confirm that my screen is Yes, being we shared. see your screen. Maybe you need to speak a little bit louder as well. I don't know where is your microphone. Okay, so I will try and speak uh, loud and clearly. Okay. Um, okay, so allow me to start the presentation. So, as Stefania mentioned, my name is oh, Nathan. Nada, I'm sorry. Uh, the interpreter said that there is a little bit of echo. I don't know if you can manage to remove your echo. So I think that this is the most clearly that I will be able to talk. Um, can you confirm that uh, this is OK for, for my OK, talking? they said it's OK. Thank okay, you, so I will try to speak as uh, clearly as possible. So yes, as Stefania mentioned, my name is Nathan Warner, and I am a team member of the environmental statistics team of the statistics division here at the Food and Agriculture Organization. Thank you both to Stefania and Esfandiar for the opportunity to be able to present the results of this report, which is named the Progress Towards Sustainable Agriculture. So I would like to start off with some background of the document. First, I would like to underline that the report and the data that is used for this report is not meant in any way to be a substitute for reporting for SDG indicator 2.4.1. However, in the meantime, as countries are reporting for the indicator, we thought that it was important to come up with some level of assessment of progress that is being made. And the data that is used for this report is based entirely on national level statistics. So that is one of the main differences between the data used for this report and 2.41 reporting is that we are using entirely national level statistics here and not uh, farm level data. 
So the way that this report is organized is that we have classified countries into four different farm system typologies. And these are the modern food systems, the traditional food systems, the land intensive mixed food systems, and the capital intensive mixed food systems. These groupings were characterized by performing for those who are interested in the uh, more detailed statistical information based on a principal component, principal component of factor productivities in which the first quartile was defined as the traditional food farm systems. The second and third quartiles were split in terms of the ratio of land to capital into land intensive and capital intensive. And the highest quartile are the modern food systems. So the, the characterizations of the different uh, food system, farm system typologies are that the traditional farm system typology is characterized by low labor and low productivity and low capital stocks. The land intensive mixed typology is characterized mostly due to its, its higher expansion of agricultural land. Whereas the capital intensive mixed are characterized by higher productivity coming mostly from a higher use of agricultural inputs. And the modern are characterized by high land and labor productivities due to high mechanization and access to modern technologies. So the coverage for the report is that we have a set of 16 indicators. You will notice some similarities in the indicators and the sub indicators also for 2.4.1 and I will list those indicators in the next slide. So we have a total of 16 indicators that we look at for the report. These are six social economic dimension indicators and 10 environmental dimension indicators. The time period in general for the report to look at progress over time, because that's again what the report is focusing on, is for most indicators dating back to 1961, whereas there are some indicators such as pesticides use or the prevalence of undernourishment, for example, that the time scope is from 1990 onwards. So the data source is uh, exclusively um, FAUSTAT data. And the, again, the, the coverage is based entirely on national level statistics. Um, this data was computed at the, the country level and aggregated according to each food systems typology. I want to mention also that these groupings that were, um, that are listed here these overlap well with those that were defined in the 2017 high level panel of experts on food security and nutrition. So in the, the report, we also have a traffic lights approach to that we use to identify sustainability hotspots. 
So these traffic, this traffic light approach also uses a qualitative assessment in terms of classifying countries and then aggregating them by food systems typology in terms of colors, which are also red, yellow, and green to each of the PROSA sub-indicators. And the way that we classify the, the, uh, the color for the traffic light are either in terms of gains and maintenance of that gain or decreases across successive periods. So one gain across one successive period is um, a traffic light uh, qualitative assignment of yellow, whereas if it's maintained for a second period, the classification is green, decreases across any two successive periods are red. So I should highlight that the, the scope of the report is crop and livestock production systems. Okay, so this is the list of the 16 uh, sub-indicators that we look at in the PROSA report. I won't um, go through every single one of them, but as I mentioned, they, they come exclusive, exclusively from FAUSTAT, with the exception of water use, which comes from Aquastat, which is another dissemination platform for water used in agriculture within FAO. And you will notice some similarities that the, we have three dimensions here, which are economic, social, and environment. And we have them classified in terms of these different themes, most of which have one indicator per theme and a couple of themes which have more than one indicator mentioned for them. Um, maybe I can just mention at least the details of a couple of the uh, indicators. So for example, I, I, if you're interested on how the diversification indices are calculated for crop and livestock, these are basically Gini coefficients that are calculated in terms of area harvested for crops or for number of livestock heads for the livestock diversification index. Okay, so those are the indicators that we look at for the report and again, focusing on trends over time for each of the food systems typologies and trying to identify those key areas for each food system typology that need to be focused on to better strengthen uh, sustainable agriculture. So I'd like to jump uh, right away to the results. So the report is organized by looking at each of the dimensions or, and indicators uh, separately. Um, we recognize that the area of sustainable agriculture is very multidimensional and that the relationships between the different indicators themselves is, um, is also multidimensional. Nonetheless, Less for the report, we, we try to focus on uh, specific indicators um, and trends of those indicators separately, drawing at the same time some of the, uh, of the relationships or the between uh, different indicators. And that's part of why we implemented this traffic light approach so that we can see the 
the multidimensional aspect. So we're focusing again on national level statistics across the relevant sub indicators. And we believe this provides a first order and complete analysis of progress towards sustainability, both in qualitative with the assignment of uh, traffic lights and quantitative ways by looking at the trends over time. So I'd like to highlight some of the, um, the key results that were identified for each of the themes. For the social economic theme, across all of the typologies, we note that uh, progress has been strong with gross output specialization trends still remaining the most limiting factor. So let me just jump back to uh, gross output specialization. So the gross output specialization is a bit similar to the uh, biodiversity indicators in that it's looking at um, it's looking at how evenly gross production is distributed across different crops and livestock. So the the, the value of gross production is computed by multiple applying gross production quantities by output prices at the farm gate. And we use the Gini coefficient to look at how evenly distributed this output value is across the different crops and livestock. From the land use theme, the Agricultural land expan expansion continues to be a limiting factor to the detriment of natural ecosystems, in particular forests. And looking at crop and livestock species biodiversity, we, we note in the report that this, these two indicators are, are key to climate re resilience in that if you have um, if you have higher diversity in terms of crops and livestock, you're, you're, less, um, you're less easily exposed to disasters that can affect specific crop or livestock species and that you can be more resilient if you have more diversity across crops and livestock. Another one of the, the dimensions has to do with the soil nutrient balance and chemical pesticides. These both remain limiting factors to agricultural sustainability in all food systems typologies, both at high levels and low levels of inputs. So if we look at the soil nutrient balance indicator for those countries that don't so the soil nutrient balance indicator is used in the report as a measure of overall soil health in that if your nutrient balance is too high, it's an indication that we are applying too much agricultural inputs for fertilizers and that it can be a detriment to sustainable agriculture Whereas for countries that may not have access to the agricultural inputs that they need, they can not be able to apply enough of these agricultural inputs and have too low levels of um, agricultural inputs. So for both at low and high levels, the soil nutrient balance can be a limiting factor. So if I, I wanted to mention also one of the, um, if we look at specific food system typologies, for example, in the report, we, we highlight as one of the examples that land intensive and modern food systems. So these are two typologies with lower levels of diversification 
but higher levels of gross output specialization, meaning that they have they have their area harvested less evenly distributed across crops, and they're more specialized in terms of output value on, on fewer crops. And we noted that this uh, is a limiting factor for these food systems because of higher level of exposure to climate risks. So I would like also to mention and talk about the uh, another section of the report that has to do with drivers of change on the path towards sustainable agriculture. So this part of the report was um, done by our colleagues in ESA, the Economic and Social uh, Department of the Food and Agriculture Organization. And the section on the drivers is, is broken down in terms of this combined assessment. So there were five steps that were performed to, to perform this uh, combined assessment. There was an extensive literature review. There were uh, the quantitative indicators that were identified, as well as the drivers to, oops. As well as the, the drivers to analyze. Um, I wanted to mention also how the drivers were analyzed. So the, the drivers of sustainable agriculture um, were selected through a screening of publicly available global data. This was based on this uh, review of literature, the reliability and country coverage of the driver indicator as well as clear correlations with the sub-indicator proxies. So these correlations for those interested more in the um, statistical methods were performed using um, a lasso approach, which is a least absolute shrinkage and selection operator to um, to decrease the dimension of the indicators that were selected for the analysis. And that's how the, the final selection of the driver and sub indicator relationships were identified. The report is broken down in terms of these five different drivers, including demographics, inequality, farm structure, global inter global integration and government support to agriculture. I would like to at least highlight one of the key um, results across all of the uh, dimensions for the drivers, which that is that government support remains one of the most important and direct mechanisms available to policymakers to encourage sustainable agricultural development. So that's an overall uh, review of the, of the report. As I mentioned earlier, this report has, so this report has already gone through um, internal and external peer review, and it should be made available um, soon. And I'm sure as soon as it becomes available, we'd be happy also to share this report with the participants. Okay, so let me give you now the floor to Martin or Martin Berlioz. Uh, finally, that we didn't manage to have him uh, yesterday. So Martin is currently a manager of the Agricultural Commodity Program at Statistics Canada. He started to work uh, um, at StatCan in 1991. Over the years, he worked in programs related to crops, livestock, finance, taxation, and census of agriculture. He was also manager of the, uh, for the new agri-environmental surveys on farm practices and water management. He will now present 
the Canada experience uh, in the SDG 241 data collection and reporting. So Martin or Martin, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Stefania. Um, can you, you can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, and uh, I'm going to ask you a favor to uh, flip the chart for sure. me, uh, the slides. So I will share my screen, okay. okay. Uh, Thank you. One second, because I was not ready. I, so yeah. let me... Uh, and I want to apologize for yesterday. I had problems for logging in and I could not log in, so... so. No problem, so. it happens. Okay, here it is, your presentation. Okay, so. Okay, done. Can you see it? Uh, yes, perfect. Okay, so we can maybe go to the next slide. Uh, I will keep an eye on the, um, uh, if I go too fast, just let me know, so. Yes, I will okay. slow down, slow down. So uh, just uh, just put it in the slideshow mode, so. Yeah, I, I did it, you don't okay, see it. Okay, that's good, okay. that's perfect. Okay, so today's presentation is really to, to talk about our experience with uh, filling out the questionnaire that we received from the FAO about the indicator 2.4.1. Uh, and what, some uh, we some approach we took that we try to follow as close as possible the the methodology, but some some place we with the data we had, so we had to to use a different different approach. But we believed it was close enough to 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 express the same uh, to exp express good result and uh, and uh, so. So that's why I said sometime we had to use some proxy. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, yes, so the the scope, we follow exactly what, what's being asked for the FAO and uh, the, the same dimension. And as I'm sure as many of you are familiar, so I won't take too much time on that. That slide. So, uh, but I'll go over each one. So, um, you can go to the next one. Yeah. So, um, so sometimes we had problems with the metrics uh, because uh, you're of the data that we rely, and it was basically the agriculture census. And sometimes we we use also remotely uh, satellite data and land cover data. Uh, the next slide or the next two slides, it will show you some challenge we have because it's a, we have a, it's a large country and it's a, and different uh, agroclimatic condition, different soil types or eco zone, and it makes it makes it difficult to provide a, nas a national assessment of sustainability for the whole country. Uh, so each region or eco zone will have different uh, challenge. So. And sometimes as well, so we the extra, extrapolation at, of survey result to uh, was a, not necessarily a challenge, but we want to be reflect of what what is what's a res, reasonable uh, re, uh, re, uh, assessment. So next slide, please. So just to show you, uh, I could also uh, have shown like, uh, just to give you some stats, uh, that's the total land area and uh, the farmland is 64.2 mil million hectare and it's mainly uh, located in the south part of Canada, southern part, um, a lot of pasture land too. And uh, uh, size, it's uh, th over 300, uh, hectare per farm but there's there are farms that are much more larger than that so it's just and the number of farm it's in the last census 2000 actually it was 2016 was uh, 193 just above above 193,000 farms next slide and this just give you an idea of the um, 
of the what I was saying, the the the, the, the diversity of eco zone and eco region, which are based on the same climate and uh, or the physiography, soil hydrology, and veget and vegetation. So, and uh, so when it comes times to aggregate at national level, that's where we sometimes we had problems to reflect the result. Uh, okay, next, please. Um, uh, so just to show you here the scope of the, the, the so basically for the land that was used, it's, uh, we had good data for crop and, right, and the livestock raise, so it was not difficult uh, to, to assess that. The economic, usually we had good data source as well to provide the, the sub-indicator result. Environmental, it's where we had uh, to use more, and it's where you have the question marks, where we just showing that we have to use some proxy. Um, uh, from sure, um, the reduction, the, the farm level um, for us was a challenge because we um, basically, when we answer the question, the questionnaire, or the, and uh, we, always come uh, uh, with that in mind that we don't want to incre increase response burden. Farmers have already had uh, to fill out many uh, survey and many, uh, and it's not just from, the, from us, uh, the National Stat Statistics Agency, but it could also be from university or res researchers. So, uh, so that's, um, that's why we, we didn't want to basically, it would be hard for us to justify to have a, a, a new survey. So basically we, we want to exploit as much as possible the, uh, the data, data that we have available. Um, so for the sub team, was, so it was usually okay. Where we had also the periodicity of the indicator, like uh, ideally three years, but uh, so the data source we had, it was uh, every five years with, basically it's uh, after the census or close to the census year. And we're fortunate because we have a census every five years. So, uh, okay, next slide, please. So, as I said, for the economic, um, uh, the, these are the, the sub indicator and uh, we use the, the uh, it was census of agriculture data so it was pretty straightforward uh, to uh, for for the fir the first the uh, output value per hectare uh, for profitability it was not as as easy because we were missing some value in the census. And for example, uh, we, we think that it's, uh, it's much easier to do that uh, using uh, national statistics at the aggregate level using a national account uh, uh, estimates. And uh, risk mitigation, this was based on assumption. Okay, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, for the the environmental dimension, uh, as I said, we had some indicators on the census of agriculture. We had the farm management survey, and it's done usually five years after the census. Actually, it's last time it was uh, uh, 2017. It was actually seven survey because we had different one one for example for cattle, one for dairy farmers, one for fruit and veg, veg, vegetable farmers. So we had different surveys and, uh, and we had also this survey, what's, what's really the challenge or what's specific, it's where you have statistician and working together with the scientists to do the, to build the survey and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, participate in those, uh, build, developing those survey in the past and, it's always a challenge to find a compromise with uh, 
what the scientists need to do a proper assessment and to build an agri-environmental landscaper and uh, not increasing too much the burden on, on farmers for answering the, the question. A lot of the answer we provide were based on the report I, 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 uh, I put here. Uh, as I said, we, it was a collaborative effort to, with my colleague at agriculture, the Department of Agriculture, which is Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And uh, they, they had this report uh, and the hyperlink is there. So very interesting. The approach is a bit different than the FAO, but it can give you ideas of uh, how they measure sustain sustainability. Next slide, please. Uh, here I'm going to, to give you an example and I'm probably going faster for the, just checking the time, but um, so the soil degradation, we based on the FAO criteria, we assessed that it was acceptable. Um, uh, we, uh, it's the combined area effect by any of the above four selected threat to soil health. And uh, because we had, uh, as I said, we had, okay, you can go to the next slide. So I don't need to read. The, so we had an assessment of, of the area that was under um, uh, uh, at possible soil degradation. So, and we we're able to assess 90% uh, uh, of lands was uh, very low risk. 87%, for example, had no or change or increase in soil organic matter. And uh, salization is, is a very limited area of Canada that's, that's susceptible to, uh, to uh, low uh, to salinization. However, if you were conduct this uh, the same analysis at the at the sub national level, and for for some area or some, uh, it will of sure for sure the result will change. So that's uh, what I said that the, when we extrapolate at the national level, sometimes you you lose the precision. So uh, next slide, please. So water availability, so desirable, the criteria here is what that's uh, uh, farm irrigation, irrigating crops is more than 10% of ag agriculture. It remains stable over the years. So next slide, please. So uh, yes, and this was easy to measure as well because we, we, uh, we do have the measure of, cr of cropland area that's irrigated on the census. So, and, uh, so uh, this was relatively easier to, to measure. Next slide, please. Um, fertilizer management. Um, so our assessment for acceptable, we use the criteria and uh, at least we were able to, for at least two measure. If you go to to the next slide, I'll show you uh, exactly the, the percentage of, uh, um, so basically what we were able to measure is that, uh, and now here I'm talking about percentage. It's where here we're taking, a, I would say a shortcut because we, we measure the percent of crop operation or crop farms instead of the actual uh, hectare that we're under uh, using uh, uh, recommended rates. And so it's the same for uh, uh, percentage of uh, for feed crop that applied liquid manure and so on. So in those dose indicator or, or or sub sub indicator, we basically use the uh, the uh, the number of operation that we're uh, using the the practice. Next slide, please. I will go quickly over those because you you've seen those in the F the FAO questionnaire. And again, for fertilizer, uh, pesticide management is, uh, it's no different than uh, fertilizer management. Um, you can go to the next slide. So 
basically we we use as a proxy we use the number of operation that add the uh, add the, for example they were rotated crop or or use bio pesticide and so on so um, and sometimes is it um, and the question oops just the question mark here is like when we say okay if the uh, for example, uh, when you comes to 35% of operation with uh, the sy systematically remove a disease plant, uh, can, for these farms, can you extrapolate those results to the uh, to the old farm or the old region? That was always a, a debate uh, we 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 had, and it was like okay, we we assume we made the assumption that if if the farmer uh, Report a practice, or uh, then it's, it was likely for uh, the related uh, crops or livestock. So, next slide, please. Uh, Agrobiodiversity. So, again, um, so you can go to the next slide. So, just to go. So, we have few farms that uh, have, uh, are certified organic uh, doesn't mean that the uh, those that are that are are not representing a large area but uh, most most likely they are usually in the fruit fruit and vegetable but we also have a grain operator and so it's more and more popular but uh, again uh, some what we don't have is we know if they're associated of, or they're certified, but we don't know uh, the number of livestock or the number of uh, acres or which crops they're they're under the. So sorry, uh, I heard someone. Okay, and you can go to the next one. Okay, for social dimension, we um, we wage rate so. Um, so, where we were saying that uh, uh, there's no, there's minimum wage, uh, it's available, but there's, uh, uh, let's see, it's, uh, it's, it's not different, it depends on uh, how was sampling done for, uh, I have a question here, the, in that case we haven't done uh, the uh, the sampling we just based on what we go to the, ne the the next slide please we just um uh we just said that uh, there we have minimum wage uh, already we have labor statistics and uh, basically we have laws and it's uh so it's for us it was really either under desirable or acceptable it was more uh, um uh, was a qualitative assessment and actual uh, 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 measure and because also it's difficult to link uh, employees to actor food and security that's that's a difficult one as well um, so next slide please so we um, uh, for example we have a household survey uh, that's based on the Canadian Community Health Survey. And it's it's possible to link that with uh, the Census of Agriculture and make those those linkage. But uh, to have this, to, when you start to link a serve, household survey or the, and to the national, it's, we have a very small, we would have a very small sample. So um, again, we, we, um, we know there's some food insecurity, but uh, we didn't have the really the resource to uh, to pursue that. Uh, the, so next slide. So um, so in terms of tenure rights to land, again, it was um, more uh, um, qualitative assessment because we we know that. Uh, um, Pretty much, uh, 
if not all, have a formal document uh, for the for ownership or right uh, for a property. And um, uh, sometimes it could be a community, but there's there's always some rights to land. So uh, next slide, please. So it's it's uh, it's well defined, and it's uh, so we we there might be some cases in uh, indig indigenous or religious communities where it's not associated to personal properties, but it's more for a group. So, but in general, we feel that there's no uh, it was de desirable or acceptable. That was our assessment. So next slide, please. Okay, so just in conclusion, I know I might have gone a bit fast, but uh, um, so we know, we recognize it's great challenge to measure sustainability. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, <coughs> pardon me. So we, we, uh, we, we, we know that as well, sorry. That the, I'm sorry, that the, um, the, the FAO develop a, a, a good framework to start measures uh, measuring sustainability. Um, it's of course we have the objective to to be comparable across countries, which is where the challenge uh, I think rely because it's um, uh, we don't have all the same uh, resource and uh, com uh, measuring sustainability uh, for. Uh, developed country versus uh, developing countries it, it's uh, it's quite uh, it so we're glad that fao will actually provide that framework and and but and also we we are as quite as uh, confident about about the information we provide even if if we had more time or we, we have more resource to to spend on it we we, we thought that uh, using proxy measure was was close enough and and we probably would get ab about the same assessment if we were going through more uh, using more efforts to uh, to um, to measure the sub indicate different sub indicator so that's it so um this is my uh, actually uh, it has changed i think over the weekend i may it's tatcan.gc.ca, but uh, uh, if I will provide it to Stefania, so or so for an update version of the presentation. So um, now let's go to the last part of this training, uh, which is the more uh, the more interactive part where. Uh, we kindly uh, not ask, ask you not to use uh, the chat box anymore, but we will be happy to listen uh, uh, your voices. And uh, of course, uh, we just ask the lead representative to talk because you are really uh, so many people. Today, we have 127. So I leave the floor to Asfandiar. We would like to have like a sort of round table where each country says his experience um we we would like to to know your expectations your uh, um issues i mean so more a, a, in a discussion point and in that moment we are going also to answer the two questions that were left over so i leave the floor to ask and yeah so just give me a second can can you hear me yes okay perfect so thank you. So over the course of last two days, we discussed the conceptual and methodological basis for SDG 241, its data collection instruments and tool and mechanism for reporting it to FAO. Um, in this presentation, we will cover the progress made by FAO until so far, our planned future course of action and expectations in terms of countries' readiness to report on the indicator in the short, medium, and long term. Our ultimate goal uh, obviously is to maximize country reporting on this indicator and thereby gradually classify it as uh, tier one over time. In summary, uh, we will cover the following aspects. So methodological front, capacity development uh, aspects, 
uh, data collection and then reporting of the indicator to FAO. Towards the very end of the presentation, uh, as Stefania mentioned, we will have uh, an open discussion around the constraints that impede country, uh, country's implementation, data collection and reporting efforts and deliberate the means and ways on how to overcome these constraints. So by now you may have a very uh, good idea that the methodology of 241 is based on farm survey uh, that is used as a main data collection instrument for all the sub indicators. Um, reaching at this stage where the methodology is now, whereby it has been approved and endorsed by the interagency and expert group on sustainable development goals, has been a long participatory process of discussion with experts, several rounds of testing and follow up technical work on the development of the support uh, uh, of the support document. So in, in this respect, um, we organized three expert group meetings. We carried out regular presentations at Scientific Advisory Committee of the Global Strategy to Improve Agriculture and Rural Statistics. We conducted an online global consultation whereby when we were developing the methodology at one stage, when it was stable enough, we shared it with the national statistical offices of all member states and we invited uh, their comments on the framework. We incorporated uh, and took into account all their feedback. And then we conducted uh, two or three webinars with the IAE GSTG members to further refine the methodology. Secondly, as I, I, was, as I was mentioning throughout uh, my presentations, we, can, we tested the methodologies in, um, um, at different stages of its, its development. So we conducted death studies in Bangladesh, Kyrgyz Republic, Ecuador, Belgium, and Rwanda. These tests, tests were conducted back in 2016 and 17. Then we carried out cognitive tests of the survey questionnaire in Kenya, Mexico, and uh, Bangladesh. And then we carried out a full-fledged field test whereby we collected information from the uh, agriculture holdings, which I mentioned to you, uh, the sample was 420 in Bangladesh back in uh, 2018 and 19. Then lastly, we uh, also tested the FAO data collection questionnaire in, in 45 countries that Stefania showed to you yesterday. But unfortunately, because of shortage of time, we are not going to be able to show you the findings of those test results, but we will happily share the presentation with you that is already sent to you, but we are going to um, make sure that uh, you have that presentation. Now, all the background and relevant documents uh, which will accompany the methodological note and the survey questionnaire have been, uh, uh, we, we have been talking about that. Those are now um, uh, finalized and uploaded to the FAO SDG portal, which I was showing you yesterday on the FAO SDG 241 page, where we are towards the right you will see all the capacity development activities and all the relevant documents that we have uh, uh, prepared and developed for SDG 241. So these include, as I was I just mentioned, the methodological note, the survey questionnaire, which will help you collect information from the field, the sampling design document, the enumerator manual, and the calculation procedure and other, other, related, uh, uh, other related documents. Now on the capacity development front, um, more than 50 plus countries have already been trained on the indicator methodology. Um, so uh, on, on this particular, uh, in this particular area, whereby we not only conducted capacity development, but we were, we were undertaking advocacy as well for the indicator at various uh, events and forums. So we presented the indicator at um, uh, African Commission on Agriculture Statistics back in 2017. The indicator was uh, presented at FAO Committee on Agriculture in 2018. Then it got presented at Brussels briefing at European Commission in 2019. And then at uh, International Conference on Agriculture Statistics in India, 2019. We also conducted bilateral training um, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam and Oman, whereby we went to the country, we sit with the uh, National Statistical Office and the Minister of Agriculture staff 
we we went through the methodology in 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 great detail and um, and 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 now most of these countries uh, like say vietnam is interested in further testing the methodology in its selected districts oman is very much interested in further um, collaborating with us on uh, on um, implementing sdg 241 uh, uh, questionnaire in 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 oman and bangladesh which was already a test country so they, they are also keen on adopting sdg 241 then we trend 10 African country in collaboration with the um, uh, United Nation Economic Commission on Africa and uh, with uh, the Ethiopian uh, Minister of Agriculture. I'm not going to go through the list of these countries, but uh, these were the 10 uh, African countries that were trained on the indicator methodology. Then uh, 17 countries from Asia and North Africa were trained in 2019. And likewise, 18 countries from Asia and Pacific uh, were trained on the ind indicator methodology. We feel very glad to be with you, to, to be with a group of countries from Latin America and Caribbean region, because this is really the very first uh, opportunity for us to engage with Latin America on 241 more formally. Previously, uh, you know, most of your countries, because I, you know, Ecuador, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, um, Chile, have been collaborating with us on the methodological aspect when we were developing in the indicator. But this is really the very first uh, uh, instance whereby, you know, the national staff of these countries is getting trained on the indicator for the first time. So we, we are really pleased about that. Then in terms of uh, advocacy and capacity development uh, this year, as I mentioned to you in my previous presentation, um, we already conducted a three days virtual training for group one, which included predominantly um, Asian, Asian countries from 8 to 10 September. You were the second group uh, of countries that got trained on the methodology. And then on the, uh, the third group will, 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 will happen uh, this uh, training will happen in in October uh, for the for the rest of the Middle Eastern and um, uh, Asian countries and some African countries. Sorry, African and Middle Eastern countries. Uh, additional uh, activities that we have carried out up until so far, the e-learning courses. I mean, you are already aware of that. I mean, we not only have the e-learning course for two for one, but for for many other SDG indicators and beyond SDGs on many other topics. So I always will encourage you to go through that course uh, and, and, and uh, you know, it's a very nice resource for you, to, for you to learn more about not only SDGs, but other important areas that FAO work in. We have translated all the key documents into Arabic, Spanish, and French. There are many other documents that still needs to get translated, but uh, hopefully that will be available soon. Uh, we also, you know, always leveraged and capitalized, uh, you know, on our uh, in-house colleagues' country missions to raise awareness about SDG 241. Um, and, you know, these missions also helped us uh, confirm information on national focal points and assess national availability on SDG 241. In 2021, uh, next year, we will continue to provide virtual trainings uh, amid, uh, amid COVID-19. Uh, because of the travel restrictions, uh, we, we cannot uh, engage in um, more bilateral in-person training. So um, this is the only way for us to deliver uh, training and uh, uh, provide technical assistance. So we will, we will continue to do that. Hopefully the situation will get better and maybe we will in person come to your respective countries to uh, help you and support you in implementation of 241. As I mentioned, we will translate all the documents, including the e-learnings into all official uh, UN languages. And we are also planning on developing digital lectures uh, on, on SDG 241 in, in 2021, whereby you know all the necessary steps in terms of how do you take uh, uh, data once it's collected? How do you, how do you an process it, analyze it, and then construct the sub-indicators? Uh, uh, so, so these uh, lectures will, will also be available in 2021. Now, in terms of um, um, uh, data collection, 
The FAO data collection questionnaire and reporting protocols have already been developed. We have been showing you uh, that Stefania uh, pre presented um, as to as to what was the structure of this questionnaire yesterday. Um, the, uh, the the following activities regarding to the data collection has have already been accomplished or uh, completed uh, with other planned in 2020. So from December 2019 to April 2020. Uh, we tested the question in 45 countries, which I previously talked about. You, you are going to have that presentation with you on the findings of the tests. Uh, in August 2020, we sent out a comprehensive dispatch uh, of the questionnaire to all member states. So uh, hopefully, you know, your national statistical offices uh, and the relevant uh, personnel related to SDG 241 have received that questionnaire. Um, uh, for them to fill it in and send it back to us by 30th of September. Uh, post from September to November, we will, we will obviously, you know, continue to collect information and then we will start analyzing it, you know, start filling the gaps and we'll carry out the quality assurance and quality uh, control process. Then in December 2020, we will draft analysis and uh, uh, finalize, uh, you know, the, the report for uh, United Nations Statistical Division. Now, the reporting to United Nations Statistical Division or UNSD will be conditional on sufficient data being reported by countries to prepare storylines and construct global and regional, regional aggregates and trends. Of course, in 2021, we will, we will re re repeat the data collection uh, cycle, that is preparation of uh, preparation of the uh, of and dispatch to countries of the questionnaire. Uh, we, will, we will repeat the same process of uh, analysis, gap filling, quality assurance and quality control. And then um, we will uh, uh, draft analysis and uh, finalize it for reporting to UNSD. Now, remember one thing, we don't expect countries to be reporting every year on 241. The reason us being reaching out to countries every year is that maybe they currently they have information available on the subset of the sub indicators, maybe three out of the 11 or maybe one out of the 11. And next year, they have another indicator on, you know, um, uh, already constructed. And hence, you know, it will be, it will be a back and forth process with the country so that we, we are engaged with them. We understand as to what their problems are and then we, uh, you know, provide support as we move along uh, during this process. Now, the first uh, formal reporting to UNSD on this indicator will be uh, in, uh, in uh, 2022 for the entire globe. Now, one an additional point that uh, um, I would like to highlight uh, is that there, you know, we we sent out this, um, um, we, we carried out this pilot exercise for SDG 241 between December and April, but you know, we, the, the, we received very low response rates. Um, and these were both expected and indicative showing the complexity of the indicator and the lack of data at the national level. Now, as I mentioned, uh, you know, on the previous slide, our short-term expectations in, uh, as FAO is basically that uh, we, we expect that country will be reporting on the partial dashboard of 241 based on farm level data. So uh, we don't expect countries uh, to be reporting on all the 11 sub indicators, okay? So even if you report on one or two, even that is a very good starting point. And then we target those indicators for which maybe methodology is not clear or for which maybe um, uh, further capacity development assistance is required, or maybe more data needs to be collected on those indicators. So we can then prioritize indicators depending on what issues are you facing at the country level, but at least you should start reporting something, uh, you know, as for the 11 sub indicators are concerned. Now from the medium to long term, um, we are gonna develop the alternative uh, uh, data collection methods as a practical solution to enable and improve reporting on SDG 241. The current methodology is around farm survey. Now, this is an alternative mechanism which we are, we, we are going to develop. Okay. So, um, uh, 
you know, from the Canada example, it was very obvious that they, they, they were using different sources of information to report on SDG 241, but we want to have a formal guidelines and practical guidelines, which are approved by the United Nations Statistical Division and the uh, IAEG STG before we recommend it to countries because it's gonna be an international standard uh, on top of farm survey. So it will be, you know, we will offer different solution to country. The countries who have a very strong agriculture survey system in place, they can use that to report on 241. The others who don't have a very strong surveys, they can use alternative data sources to report on SDG 241 or maybe a combination of these all. Um, in parallel, we will, uh, we will continue our outreach and capacity development support to countries in close uh, coordination uh, with, uh, obviously, with 50 by 2030 uh, initiative uh, to collect and analyze detailed farm level data for SDG uh, 2.4.1 monitoring. So this is the slide from the, from the previous, uh, 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 from the yesterday's presentation, whereby I mentioned that basically, um, many other sources of information can be used or leveraged to report on the on, on these sub indicators. Now, how to use these, these different sources of information, administrative data, census. Uh, this is the approach which, is, uh, which has already been developed. Now, environmental monitoring systems, GIS and remote sensing, household surveys, others. How can we use these uh, for, for, for countries to report on SDG 241? This though is indicated in the methodology, but it is not developed fully. And this is the stream of work that I was uh, talking about in my, uh, in my previous slide. Now, the use of uh, alternative data sources um, to report on the selected indicator of two for one may seem intuitive and may seem cost effective and may seem very appealing and attractive uh, however, both technically and operationally, it is not as straightforward and involves several challenges to be addressed before its use. So many countries have been saying, no, we want to use our existing uh, sources of information, but how can you use the existing sources of information? Then it's, it becomes really very complicated and challenging. Um, now, the, the, the actual problem is that these alternative, the, the way the SDG 241 sub indicators are designed, we are not only collecting data on the indicators, but then we have, you know, basically uh, developed these thresholds to assign sustainability statuses. So the moment you, you shift away from farm survey, which through questions and then through combination of some criteria, depending on the fulfillment of the, those criteria, we then assign farm sustainability status, right? Like say, for example, of the eight measures, how many the farm is complying with. So if it's complying with four, it's green. If it's complying with two, it's yellow. If it's complying with zero, it's red. Now, if the moment you, you go to GIS, how do you then, you know, basically uh, come up with these thresholds based on which we will be assigning, uh, you know, red, yellow, and green statuses to the agriculture area of the country. And hence it becomes difficult. So, and the problem doesn't stop here. So if there are countries who are reporting using uh, existing data sources, uh, sorry, farm survey, and there is another country who, which is using alternative data sources, how then you compare those results? Are those results consistent uh, uh, you know, with each other? Will it tell a different story? Will it capture you know, an entire, entirely different, uh, will it come up with an entirely different assessment? So these are the issues and challenges that, that usually are with alternative data sources. Now, these may have different objectives, scale of assessment, scope and definition. So not all the alternative data sources have the same, uh, you know, not, on, not all are nationally representative or maybe their scale of assessment is different or maybe they are only covering crops or maybe this study is only for, for livestock and maybe it's using definitions which are not uh, internationally recognized. Plus, you know, temporal resolution and periodicity of the data set. So if this is an ad hoc study, which was conducted back, back in 2010, and there is no re repetition of that study, then those dated estimates from the past, unless those are updated, are useless because we cannot use extrapolations and interpolations and uh, coefficients 
or growth rates for us to uh, you know uh, um, uh, basically come come up with the most recent uh, estimates so this is an additional problem with alternative uh, data sources sampling issues differences in design size under and and non coverage or uh, you know so if if some country says that basically decent work wage rate uh, in agriculture we can compile this information using labor force survey so then you know what is the coverage of that labor force survey it is is it covering very well the agriculture uh, sector is the agriculture sector well represented in that survey can can you know by taking information from the labor force survey can we can we generalize it for the entire country so that that's another question then different unit of measure so in case of farm survey because 241 talks about farm or farm holdings and then it talks about agriculture area because we are assigning sustainability statuses to the agriculture area of the country so if there is another survey for which the unit of observation and measurement is different how do you then you know basically relate or associate that information with farm with, with agriculture area so that's uh, that's another major challenge uh, which 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 needs to be taken into account so and then adjusting and harmonizing different baselines across different countries some countries may have a baseline of 2005 other country may have a baseline of 2015 how do you how do you adjust for that across different countries and across different uh, um, alternative data sources and then integrating data from different data sources is, is, is also complicated it's complicated because uh, there is a lack of an efficient mechanism for inter and inter institutional coordination. So let's say, for example, the production uh, prices uh, related data to agri agriculture is usually collected by the National Statistical Office or Ministry of Agriculture. But the information related to environmental aspects maybe is with some other department, right? So, so the moment you you steer away from one single data source which is farm survey which is easy because it's under the custodianship of the national statistical office and you are using a single tool periodically and and you are going to the field and collect collecting data on all the 11 sub indicator by administering a set of questions but the moment you go to alternative data sources then we are talking about different institutions so you need to build that coordination mechanism amongst all these institutions for uh, for country to be able to report on on the 11 sub indicators so that's uh, that's another another uh, major point that that needs to be taken into account so alternative data sources let me highlight this point once again may be very appealing may 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 appear reasonable and cost effective and practical but there are numerous challenges because um, you know it's, uh, it's 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 not easy in terms of its implementation and um, and usage for sdg 241 reporting now as as i mentioned earlier uh, alternative data sources can be used though you know but then the following criteria needs to get fulfilled which i was which i explained in my previous presentation as well so the the first criteria is the alternative data sources should give the result of at least same quality as the farm survey result so this is uh, this is one and and there could be many instances whereby like say for example alternative data sources may be of a better quality than farm survey result especially for the for the sub indicators in the environmental dimension but then again how do you how do you make sure that you are you are uh, um, capturing the same uh, the same phenomena because like say for example if you use gis the problem is already there it will show you the extent of the problem so it will give you an entirely different spectrum of yellow, green, and red than if you go by farm survey approach. So this was the case when we were discussing it with Belgium. So, um, so, so we, you know, based on our discussion with them, um, based on the GIS, the results were shown entirely different for a given agriculture area than, than, than as opposed to farm survey, farm survey approach. So, you know, you, we need to be careful about that too. As I mentioned, it can be attributed to agriculture land area in the country, considering the different farm typologies and agriculture regions. So if you cannot relate the 
information collected through administrative records, through uh, uh, land registers, to the agriculture area, then you know that information is useless because you cannot say anything about the agriculture area as to whether it's sustainable or not. Um, then it can be uh, associated with the country agricultural production systems, particularly crops and livestock are a mix of both, which is the scope of this indicator. So if there is a study which is particularly focused on livestock, but it's not covering crops, then, then what? I mean, you are capturing one aspect, but you are not going into another and hence the information will be collected, but it may not be sufficient for you to report on that particular sub indicator. Uh, I, I explained this one, capture the same aspect phenomena as a proposed farm survey approach, a representative of situation at the national level with respect to agricultural land area. Okay, this is a very interesting, you could have maybe certification systems, you, could, you can maybe have some kind of studies conducted for a certain, you know, region or a certain agro, agroecological zone of a country. So how do you how do you then generalize the results of uh, of, of, uh, of those three surveys? So um, that that's another issue. So how do you make use of the information which is not nationally representative? And then lastly, you know the alternative data sources before it used needs to be compliant both with international as well as national standards and classification system so that uh, you know the estimates once uh, once derived by constructing the indicator should be internationally comparable again we are in a sdg process we are in a universal process so you know, for us to compare countries we need to all country needs to follow um, the same uh, standards and classification systems so that uh, you know uh, uh, we can we can um, um, compare and contrast countries so as I, I, as I was mentioning, there, there was a large interest um, from countries that we still would like to use alternative data sources. And uh, though the methodological note of SCG 241 is providing some kind of, you know, uh, indication for country to use it, but it doesn't go into the details on how to, okay? So, um, so this is why um, we have um, started this program of work on alternative data sources. So from October to December, we have already um, uh, started working. We have onboarded uh, experts uh, who, who are going to help us uh, work on, the, uh, on, on, on further developing this approach. To begin with, we will start with remote sensing. So remote sensing or earth observation, and then we will see as to how can we use how can we make use of remote sensing, GIS, or earth observation to report on some selected sub-indicator of 241. There are many sub-indicators which still, for, for those information, will still come from farm survey. Like say, for example, for land productivity, for uh, profitability, for uh, resilience, for, um, uh, for maybe um, uh, decent work in social dimension because farm survey is better suited to collect that kind of information at a farm level. But you would still need to use farm survey. But then again, for some of the sub indicator, like say, for example, uh, uh, water variation in water availability, uh, fertilizer pollution risk or pesticide, uh, pesticide risk or, uh, you know, biodiversity. Uh, so can be, we have some loose ideas, we are not yet sure as to whether we can use remote sensing to, 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 to basically construct those indicator, but that's the plan that um, basically we will develop this approach. Then uh, our plan is to expand this effort, not only to, you know, in, uh, not only to focus only on the remote sensing, but explore other data sources, which I just explained on the previous slide. So apart from remote sensing, how can we use administrative records? How can we use livestock and uh, you know, uh, uh, agriculture census? How can we use or make use of uh, monitoring systems? How can we make use of household surveys on top of remote sensing for, 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 for it to be uh, used as an option to report on 241? Of course, soon after, uh, we will develop the test protocols um, and, and then select test countries to compare the information you know, uh, collected, collected through earth observation 
vis-a-vis -vis the farm survey approach because we want to compare and construct the result of these two approaches. So once these are, uh, so we will then select test countries and um, then we will triangulate the farm survey and earth observation and other sources of data to see as to whether uh, it makes sense, right? And once these are tested, we will draft these guidelines uh, on how earth observation and other data sources can be used to report on SDG 241. And finally, these guidelines will be ready for uh, dissemination uh, to countries, hopefully uh, by December uh, 2021. Now with this, uh, I, I, will, I, will, uh, I will take a pause if you have any question and then we, then we go, go to the uh, open discussion around uh, SDG 241. So thank you. Thank you, Spangar. Uh, I, uh, I don't see any question, but uh, I don't know, Alda, uh, are you going to translate those, um, those uh, discussions you are having? Um, sí, claro. Me gustaría saber eh, si hay alguien, digamos, un poco interesado en conversar primero. Okay, okay. Then uh, um, I would uh, suggest uh, um, Aspanjar. Mm -hmm. to answer uh, uh, the, the, the question from maybe uh, Ricardo Salas from Costa Rica. What do you think? Yeah, no problem. Just to, to, to break the ice. The, the one uh, which you sent me in my yeah. email, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Do you want to quickly say the question and the answer or do you want me to read all? Uh, no, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. So yeah. just, just give me a second. Okay. So the question, okay, let me just open. So the question was uh, actually that, um, okay. Mm -hmm. So this was from Mr. Ricardo, right? Yes. Okay. So the question was, I wanted to tell you in, in our country, Costa Rica, we have area and production data for at least 70% of the crops. However, we do not have it limited if it is a sustainable farm or a farm that does not use this type of tools. Of the crops that we have data, it is because they are specialized institutions for many of them. For example, Corbana, that analyzes the whole subject of banana. A great effort is being made to have registration system for all producers where they indicate the area produced, but it does not analyze the production issue. The system is still in pilot testing. Now to complete the questionnaire that you have considered this type of situation in the countries, um, I, I have been left with this concern since many times we do not have the resources to be able to monitor all the farms, whether sustainable or not. And to be able to take data, for example, on irrigation, agrochemicals, among other aspects that the indicator analyze in its matrix with the subject of sustainable farm. So look, this question is very interesting. Now there are two things. We showed you the methodology of SDG 241. We showed you its conceptual basis. We showed you that the methodology is structured around or designed around farm survey. Now, for, for you to estimate sustainable agriculture or for you to estimate like say, for example, an aspect of sustainable agriculture um, of, the, of the 11 we, which we listed, you need, to, you need to make sure that the key ingredients, okay, or the fundamental building blocks of that particular sub-indicator aspect 
are integrated into your current agriculture statistical system. This is a must. Unless you do that, you cannot report because without a recipe, you cannot, you know, maybe prepare a meal. So for you to have your recipe, you need to have your ingredients. So you need to have those ingredients. We are telling you these are the ingredients and this is how this is the recipe on how to prepare, you know, SCG 241 uh, meal. So from this perspective, unless you have the ingredients and unless you have the recipe, you cannot uh, basically going to be able to to report on uh, SCG 241. Now, having said that, um, now you need not to monitor and collect data from all farms for you to be able to estimate 241 at the national level. So we, we are not advising countries to do complete enumeration of all the agriculture holdings and then collect data from the exhaustive list of whatever exists at a country level. So it's not a census approach, okay? This is in fact a standard survey approach that we recommend and it's based on instead a nationally representative sample, okay? So, so again, let me corroborate. Complete enumeration and coverage of farm, farms is not required. You need to have a rich enough sample, a sample which is representative or a subset of the entire universe of farms to be able to estimate the 11 sub indicator. And this is, this is a cost effective approach, which is easy to implement. Now to elaborate further, unless you have incorporated the data items and variables needed to construct the 11 sub indicators, you won't be able to report on sustainability. So as a first step, you need to look into your current agriculture surveys, map it against the requirement of SDG 241 to see what is already covered and what is missing in there. Once the missing questions are included in the current agriculture survey, only then would you be able to construct the 11 sub indicator using the farm survey approach of SCG 241. Now, if your current surveys are limited in scope, okay, are focused only on certain crops, but not others, then, you know, this is, this could very well be an opportunity for you, the SCG 241 could very well be an opportunity for you to improve your entire agriculture statistical system because you still need this information to, for you to make informed policies and decisions at the country level. Now the SDG 241 data is not only for 241, it has many other usages as well. Like say, for example, the information that you collect for the productivity and the profitability uh, indicators, which is on revenues and on cost of, um, on cost of uh, production, that information is not only gonna be used for 241, but it's going to be used for SDG indicator 231 and 232, so two other SDG indicators, plus the same information is used by countries to, to prepare national accounts, to prepare, uh, you know, the gross value addition or gross value added of agriculture in terms of its contribution to, 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 to the GDP. So you still need those figures for you to estimate your gross domestic product. SDG 241 is giving you an additional incentive for you to, for you to, uh, you know, basically improve your agriculture statistical system. And, and, and mind you, I mean, so many aspects are, are covered by SDG 241 in a single framework, which is, which is, which is, which is going to give you an extra strength in terms of, uh, you know, the National Statistical Office or Ministry of Agriculture or Ministry of Environment, whichever institution you are representing, to, to, improve on, um, to improve on your policy making. So I would say that um, basically, if there are scoping issues with your current surveys, the scoping needs to be improved. If there are a coverage issue in terms of if there is under coverage that needs to get improved. If there is uh, an issue whereby you don't collect information on certain aspects of the farm, like say for example, agrochemicals, inputs, uh, prices, then that, that needs to get improved. So you can have a very, um, you know, um, fruitful discussion with your, uh, with your high ups or with your, uh, with, with, with your superiors that look by implementing 241, we are not gonna only be reporting on sustainable agriculture, okay? But, um, but also, you know, we are gonna improve so many other processes. 
And mind you, it's not about reporting on the SDG indicator. That's not the, that's not the idea. This should be clear to all of you. The idea is to improve your national policy making so that your agriculture becomes more resilient and more sustainable over time. Okay, thank you, uh, Aspanjar. I think uh, uh, you answered very um, precisely. Uh, we don't have any new questions, so I'm just asking uh, Mr. Martinez, I think we have answered the, your question from yesterday about the complementary data. So I'm not going through your question, but in case you have any doubts, still you can ask. Um, we had one comment from Valeria Hames, uh, Brazil, uh, Aspanjar. Uh, I don't know if you want to touch base also on this question about um, carrying out other trainings or want to answer maybe later. Like, uh, okay, so let me, let me take this up. I mean, we would, we would like you to reach out to us more formally. So please write to us. Please write to oh, us. Maybe, your... maybe, maybe we don't want to, to read the question so that everybody okay. understand. Okay, please, please do that. Okay, from Brazil. So will it be possible to carry out other trainings of multiple, multiple multipliers like this? using this material and audiovisual resources for researchers from the ODS and Panada network, for example. Our network has 885 researchers who work in agricultural research. So yes, primarily, let me put it this way. Us as FAO, as a UN agency, we have a mandate to produce global public goods, okay? And by global public goods, we mean to say methodology, standards, and classification systems that are in open source, which can be used by, by countries, by country experts that, you know, from the National Statistical Office or policymaker from the Ministry of Agriculture, but as well for, for, for researchers, for academia, for, for, for many other uh, experts belonging to different disciplines and walks of life. Now, our mandate is to engage with countries. So we are bound by our, uh, by, by our charter to work closely with country representatives for us to improve their agriculture statistical systems so that they are able to make um, uh, well-informed policies. And hence, in the process, uh, it will help them reduce poverty, eliminate hunger, and uh, you know, uh, eliminate hunger and malnutrition. So, from this perspective, uh, we have a very defined um, uh, mandate in terms of uh, whom we can uh, whom we can provide capacity development assistance to, or uh, or basically provide support support to, both technically and monetary terms. But having said that, I would we would like you to reach out to us more formally via an email and then we discuss it internally here with our uh, with our uh, you know superiors and uh, once we discuss that then we uh, we will think about way, means and ways on how can we better support uh, better support uh, your your network or your consortium of uh, of researchers Okay, very do good. We have one extra question uh, from Mr. Pablo Gallo Mendoza, and then maybe we can leave the open discussion. We will start the open discussion. The representative sample is based on the census sampling frame. I don't know if the question. The representative sample is based on. Uh, that is what he said. So the representative sample is based on the census sampling frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So of course, I mean, census, census serve as a tool for you to derive your frame, your sampling frame from, from, okay? So the most updated census can be used if, if, it, if, it, if it is a complete enumeration of all the agriculture holdings at the country level, then you can use that to derive the frame for your agriculture survey for you to have a nationally representative estimate. So yes, a national uh, a census uh, can be used as a tool to derive a frame for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for your agriculture survey. 
Now, I mean, the frame would already exist at a country level for your agriculture surveys. All you need to do is you have to look at the, let me just quickly show that. I mean, Stefania, before I forget, this is very important. So I was, you know, yesterday I went through the, okay. So this is the survey module that we have created for, for, for SDG 241. And it is created as both as an independent survey, as well as, uh, you know, um, uh, questions from here can be integrated you in your current agriculture surveys. So in this, in this tool, which has been translated into Spanish as well, has all the required information that you need for you to be able to report on 241. So you, you'll have a look at that and you have a look at your current agriculture survey. And then you see as to where, you know, which questions are you missing. And then from here, you just start integrating those questions into your agriculture survey for it to be SDG 241 ready. So as you can see here, we have a section one on introduction of the survey module and identification of the holder and the holding. Now, why we have this introduction, introductory section? Because in many countries, agriculture survey doesn't exist. Or if it exists, those are purely production surveys, okay? They don't ask about the environmental aspects of the, of, the, of, the, of the holding. So, you know, for those countries, if they want to implement a separate survey for SG241, they can, they can take this and implement it. For other countries, we strongly recommend to take questions from here and integrate it into their, uh, their current uh, agriculture uh, survey. So, so all the information, uh, you know, about the identification of the holding, then the area of the holding, which we spoke about, land tenure, land use, common land, et cetera, then economic dimension of the holding. So this section will help you collect information on the, on the three indicators in the economic dimension. Um, and mind you, with this, with this uh, tool, with this uh, survey questionnaire, you have all the supporting material, which I talk, talked about, enumerator manual, calculation procedure, sampling guidance, et cetera. So all this is linked to that. Then you have, a section on environmental dimension of the holding. So it has all the questions that will help you collect information on the, on the five sub indicators for the, for the environmental dimension. And then finally, you have the, the section on the social dimension of the holding. And it has all the question that, 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 that will help you collect information on the three indicator in the social dimension. So let's say, for example, the, the, the first sub indicator in the social dimension, all you need to have is two questions integrated into your, your current agriculture statistical survey. And mind you, usually the, the information on, on labor is already there. You, you only need to have maybe one additional question there, okay? Similarly, for, for land tenure, this, 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 this information is usually collected in an agriculture survey or census. All you need to make sure is as to whether this kind of information is already provided there. If not, you just take maybe a question or two from here and plug it in there, integrate it with, 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 with your current agriculture statistical survey, and, 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 and then you are good to go. So you will be able to report on one, one indicator. So all the groundwork, all the basic work has been carried out. All you have to do is, please, I would insist, I would encourage, I would appreciate if you go through all the material that we have shared with you. Have a look, you know, uh, com compare it and benchmark it with your current agriculture surveys or other, other sources of information that you have in your country and see as to what's there and what's missing. And then reach out to us and ask us, okay, fine, these X, Y, Z question is missing in, in my survey, how we can incorporate this, where can we incorporate this? And, uh, you know, how we are, we are gonna go about administering this question uh, within the context of our agriculture survey. So this is, this is, uh, this is, I wanted to show this. I mean, you already have, you already have it, but we will happily share it with you once again. Okay. So in, uh, it's time to officially close uh, this second round of virtual training on the SDG 241. I would like to thank officially Alda for her precious support at the time of the organization and also during uh, these three days. She has been really crucial for the smooth running of the training, especially during the so active sessions of question and answers. Thanks a lot to the translators, Jasmine and Andrea, 
they were they have done a great job and translated everything very professionally and carefully i and finally i think i can thank us on behalf of, of the of all the participants we have got so many messages that you have carried out a training in the perfect way replying with passion and enthusiastically exhaustively to all questions and last but not least thanks to all of you for having participated in this uh, round of virtual training we hope you have enjoyed it and that we have uh, helped you gain a clear understanding of the methodology of the two for one indicator in the end uh, in this extraordinary circumstances with the pandemic allow, allowed us to train more than 150 participants which is for sure something that would have been very hard to achieve in a in a in a with the, an in-person training uh, i leave the floor to aspandiar for the last closures and then switch off uh, switch on all the camera please so we take a photo all together. So thank you, Stefania. Thank you, Alda. Thank you, the translators, especially. I mean, they, they, they are sitting even late today. So uh, thank you very much to the interpreters. And thank you to the esteemed and respected participants. Thank you for your patience. It was a very complex, very tiring, very um, um, uh, intense course. Uh, so thank you for your patience and uh, for, for making yourself available. The, the journey doesn't stop here. It has just begun. So basically, we would like to carry forward this collaboration with the Latin American countries, Argentina, Peru, Chile, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador. Um, forgive me if I forgot any name. It's not on purpose. It's not on in, intentionally. But thank you very much to all of you. And we would definitely like to work more with, uh, with, with your countries. Please write to us you know, officially so that we can engage with you and take this forward uh, one, step, one step more so that we are able to jointly um, basically um, defeat hunger and eliminate hunger and malnutrition everywhere, uh, including your countries and uh, you know, from the entire globe. So thank you very much. So now please smile so that I take several pictures because we are quite a lot. It's not easy. Okay, I took the first picture. Let me go to the second. Okay. In the meantime that I take the pictures, of course, uh, uh just to say again we will answer all the questions that were not answered uh, during the training i have took i have taken notes of everything so don't worry you will be answered and we are always available for extra questions Still a few seconds please okay last question lazy last photo okay done so thank you again we will send a report and uh, uh, a summary of this training and uh, all the materials as we have promised so you will receive everything probably tomorrow because here it's already 8 p.m so it's time for us to rest uh, and for you too of course have a nice day Bye-bye.